series. Welcome back to the Completions and Workover series from PetroSkills. In this section, we'll be talking about unconventional wells as part of our specialized advanced completion technology section. Let's get into it. Let's talk about the shale reservoir characteristics first. These, the lateral extent of these deposits are massive oftentimes covering hundreds or several hundreds of square miles. So they're on a basin scale rather than a, a much smaller scale like we have in conventional reservoirs. Many of these are overpressured, but not always. Water in our shales is not gravity segregated like it is in conventional reservoirs. Okay, we, we have water entrained, but it's not uh, we don't have down dip water in these like we do in conventionals. Very large reserves associated with these, these wells, very large oil in place and gas in place numbers associated with them as well. But obviously, they still need to be economic in order to develop. The thickness varies considerably, sometimes less than 30 feet, sometimes several hundred feet thick. The permeability can be down in the nano Darcy range, obviously very tight rock and can, uh, but we also see sections that sometimes have uh, in the tenths of millidarcies. Fractures, we initially thought natural fractures were essential to the, the commerciality of the unconventionals, but we know that's not the case now. We can create our own fractures. What we have found is that the shale content can be very important as to the economic viability of our shales. Generally speaking, the lower the shale content, the better. Oftentimes, less than 40% is, is what we find in the better shales. Some, uh, sometimes up to 50%, but generally speaking, less than 40. Uh, much different type uh, permeability than we see in conventional reservoirs. This rock is, is fairly brittle, it's in, in the more frackable it is, the better reserves we, we see in our wells. So the higher the sand content, generally speaking, the better type reservoir it makes. Compared to conventional reservoirs, these are much more homogeneous, okay? We don't have laminations of throughout like we do in, in most sandstones. Um, they're not entirely homogeneous, but again, compared to conventional, much more. We do, we have both prop fractures and unprop fractures that are created w during our fracking process. And of course, we'd like to get as many of those fractures propped as we can, but we've actually found that the unprop fractures also aid to the deliverability of the well so that they don't absolutely have to be. But if they're propped, the conductivity uh, between the, the prop fracture and the unpropped, or, or in the shale, is extremely high, which of course is what you want. This slide here is a triangle diagram showing that the, the min mineralogical distribution of, of quartz, carbonates, and shales in, in rock. And what we have found, again, here's the 50% shale. So it, it, in order to be economical, it has to be south of that 50% line. And we find uh, that the uh, Barnett shale falls over here more on the quartz section of the distribution triangle. And the Eagle Ford has a, a more of a carbonate component to it. But we, so we can find them on both sides, either more quartz or more carbonate, but uh, definitely the lower the shale content, the better. The production rates from these, uh, even though it's very low permeability, the production rates can be quite high. But because it is such low perm, we have to frack these, and we, we frack them, uh, as I like to say, we frack the snot out of them. Typically 10 to 40 fracks per lateral. And if the, the laterals are typically 3,000 to 10,000 foot long, the frack half lengths vary significantly, but generally they're in the hundreds of feet. 
we can see initial production rates, 20 million a day for, for the gas wells is not uncommon at all and, and substantially higher than that as well. After fracking is critical. One, we have to get the, the well bore clean and uh, get all the, the frack plugs and the, the balls and, and uh, the produced sand, get that out of there. But also we have found that managing the flow back is critical to the ultimate recovery in these. So we, we oftentimes will not pull them real hard. We will hold some back pressure on them and uh, get better results. Water distribution, as I said previously, it's not gravity segregated like conventional reservoirs. So you don't worry about down dip water. Although we do have some situations like in the Barnett Shale where there is an aquifer below the Barnett Shale and there are regions of that where there's fractures and, and so if we drill near these fractures, we can end up getting water out of the Arbuckle, which can be very difficult to, to overcome. The flow in our shales are very difficult to model, and we're not there yet. We work, we're working on it. There's, there's obviously a lot of effort going into attempting to model the production flow, but each shale is different. Uh, it's very complicated, and we're not there yet. The production decline on these is very steep. Typically, we lose 80 to 90% of the flow rate in the first year or two. That's extremely steep. The economics, as this says, tend to favor long laterals with greater than 20 frack stages in the wells. And um, we just continue to, to, to put more and more frack stages in these wells as we, as we learn and advance our technologies in these shale basins. It requires multiple fracks, as we said. Initially, we started with somewhere in the eight to 10 fracks per lateral. Now we average 20 or more uh, per, per well. The frack sizes vary significantly. Uh, and as soon as I point out numbers like this, someone's gonna say, well, we, we put bigger jobs than that. And yes, these aren't a, a end all as far as in terms of the size of fracks, but somewhere from one to 400,000 pounds of propent per stage. So if you put 20 or 25 stages in a well, that's over 10 million pounds of propent in the well. And somewhere between 1,000 to 10,000 barrels of fluid per stage, so in a 20 or 25 stage well, that may be something around 8 million gallons of water. We do need to control, we need to, to, to develop our technology in order to control the cost. We, we've said that all along and we've done a good job of that. Now with the drop in oil prices and gas seems to be falling as well, it makes this even more important that, that, that we uh, find ways to, to cut costs and improve our methods, our, our total recovery. Pad drilling, zipper fracks, completion timing, these are all things that, that uh, we are advancing in the shales. Uh, how we uh, manage the, the reservoir, and how we manage, how we align our fracks, whether we uh, stagger them or make them parallel, the timing of those offset completions, how hard we pull these wells, all are factors in managing the depletion of the well. How we do our interventions, uh, that, that varies. And uh, of course, these wells come on initially flowing quite high rates, but uh, we, we uh, quickly, go to artificial lift on these wells, and so they do require interventions. And we're finding that, particularly in the older wells, that we're refracking many of them and uh, increasing their deliverability and increasing their reserves and have seen, seen some encouraging results in that. But there's uh, a lot yet to be learned on refracking our wells. Okay, these things, drain a pretty large area. Again, we, we're, we're drilling four and 5,000 foot laterals on a regular basis, in some areas 10,000 feet, and then fracking out away from that. So we're, we are draining some pretty large areas. On the surface, 
we need a pretty big location to pull off these frack jobs. Well integrity, we have well integrity issues. Uh, in some areas we, where we have casing failure problems when we frack our wells and uh, still have some to learn there. Fracking is the key to the success of these, this, these shale plays. They wouldn't be successful if we hadn't learned how to drill a series of fracks along the lateral. What size tubulars do we run in the well? Typically somewhere between two and three, two and three eighths and three and a half inch. Probably more two and seven eighths and three and a half than two and three eighths. Casing sizes four and a half to seven inch. Most companies that, that I run across are cementing their liners in the hole, but some still use uh, the external casing packers and the Packers Plus type uh, style. Most of these wells are drilled fairly horizontal, and once we set the azimuth, we're, we're of course trying to drill perpendicular to the minimum horizontal strength of the reservoir, and we, we hold that direction in a pretty straight shot. Okay, this slide is entitled Impact of Cost Control. As it says, the drilling and completion costs for these wells vary from, this says a million to twenty million dollars. There aren't many wells drilled in the, the shales for a million dollars, but several million dollars uh, for these wells and it's, so we have to minimize our rig time in order to make our completion as efficiently as possible. If we're going to do that, then we push as much of the intervention to the wire line as we can. And so we deploy wire line, we're able to pump them down hole to do our perforating, set our plugs and all that, save a great deal of money over coil tubing or conventional workover rig. All right, so when we look at the frack design for these horizontal wells, it's significantly different than for conventional frack jobs, conventional wells. It's extremely low permeability, and so that low permeability means that there's not near as much leak off in these reservoirs as in more conventional reservoirs. So because there's less leak off, we don't need as viscous of fluids to carry our propent, nor because of the tightness of the rock and the low perm, we don't need as high a concentration of propent in the fractures as well. So lower viscosity gels, less leak off control, less propent concentrations, all help to keep costs down. The other thing is we use much smaller propent. Very common to pump a lot of hundred mesh in these at low concentrations. But we also are getting around to where we're pumping more 40, 70, and 30, 50 propent as well. Slick water fluids are still used, but we're also, in some areas, pumping linear gels and cross-link gels too. If we run both linear and cross-link, we tend to call that a hybrid fluid. fluid. These fractors, fracks are pumped at extremely high rates somewhere, most of them, at 70 to 100 barrels per minute. In order to frack these wells, obviously we have to perforate them first before we can frack. And the challenge, one of the big challenges, is getting that first perforation done in the tow. Initially, we used to use coil tubing to get out there and make that first perforation, but we have figured out with, with uh, R&D, they have come up with new ways to do it, much cheaper, and much simpler, and these tow valves, we run these tow valves in our string that pump open. We pump those, that open with pressure. It creates communication with the reservoir. At that point, we can pump down our perforating guns. When we pump our perforating gun down the hole, we will perf several perf clusters over, say, a 200-foot interval maybe four or five puff perf clusters within 200 feet. Then we'll frack those together. Then we'll pump down a frack plug and another perforating gun, set that frack plug, perf another set of perf clusters containing one to three feet of perforations, and just repeat that step over and over again. We, we perforate these things with casing guns so we can get the big charges and uh, get nice deep penetrations 
and we find that that works better in, in terms of getting our fracks away. So again, we, we just repeat that step over and over again until we've fracked our way all the way back to the heel. Okay, so that's how we perforate the wells. Now how do we frack them? Well, we normally frack at very high rates, 70 to 100 barrels per minute. The treating pressure that we are, are allowed to go up to is gonna be a function of our casing design, so that will vary from area to area depending on the casing we use. And we also run composite frack plugs when we, we set the, the frack plugs prior to perforating because they're easier to drill out. Normally when we pump our equipment down the hole, we'll pump one barrel per minute during the vertical section and about 12 barrel per minute in the horizontal. And then we'll just repeat that process 20 to 40 times.